This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1016, recorded on June 15th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Big day tomorrow at the FDA, Daniel. Uh, yes, yes. I, I think we're hearing some rumors about, you know, so. Well, Paul Offit, last time I, I saw him yesterday in Philly, he said they're going to pick a new booster to give everybody over six months of age. <laughs> It, it, it's interesting. I've heard I've heard Paul's and I've heard someone else's uh, take on things, and and I think by the time this drops, we'll have uh, we'll have sort of a conclusion. It's probably going to be a monovalent XBB, and uh, yes, and there's going to be this split. People like Paul Offit are going to say, so what is this going to offer? And then based on that, who should get it? And other people are going to just say, everyone needs to get it. I'm you not know. getting it, Daniel. <laughs> I, I have three, three vaccines. I have an infection. I'm good. Let's. Like, I'm gonna. Let's return to that. All right. Um, All yeah, right. we gotta. We gotta return. So let's. First, I am wearing my polio bow tie, and people will soon understand why. Um, also, I'll say right up front, this is one of those episodes that is going to be longer than 21 minutes. So when we get to 21, I'll try to give people a heads up. They can pause, break it into two 21-minute digestible components. Uh, but right off my quotation, there are two ways to be fooled. One is to believe what isn't true, and the other is to refuse to believe what is true. And that's by Soren Kierkegaard. And uh, let's start off with polio, MMWR, surveillance to track progress towards toward poliomyelitis eradication worldwide 2021 through 2022 came out on June 9th. Um, and we've discussed before that the primary means for detecting polio virus is through acute flaccid paralysis surveillance, um, you know, waiting till people are paralyzed, which is supplemented by environmental surveillance of sewage samples. Now, during 2021 through 2022, among 34, they refer to as priority countries experiencing or at high risk for polio virus transmission. Um, only, I added the only, 76.5% met national AFP surveillance indicator targets, and the number of environmental surveillance sites increased by 31%. However, substantial national and subnational AFP surveillance gaps persist. That's what we're hearing this report. Um, and they finish by saying high quality surveillance is critical for the timely detection of circulating polio virus and the rapid activation of outbreak response vaccination activities to stop transmission. Um, they recommend countries should maintain high quality surveillance by monitoring surveillance indicators to identify gaps, enhance the sensitivity and timeliness of surveillance activities, and guide program decision making toward polio eradication. And I'm going to just mention um, an article that I just ran across, uh, actually was enjoying this morning. It's the benefit of getting up early, cup of coffee, and uh, the latest nature. Um, in nature, we have genetic stabilization of attenuated oral vaccines against polio virus types one and three. Um, so we've discussed a few times the, the benefits of the novel type two oral polio vaccine um, with promising clinical data on genetic stability, not 100%, and immunogenicity, quite robust. So here the authors report the development of two additional um, attenuated vaccine candidates against type 1 and 3 polio viruses. Uh, the candidates were generated by replacing the capsid coating region um, of the NOPV2, the novel type 2 oral polio vaccine, uh, with that from Sabin 1 um, and 3. 
these or or three depending it's two separate ones here so these chimeric viruses show growth phenotypes similar to the NOPV2 and immunogenicity comparable to their parental Sabin strains but are more attenuated experiments in mice and deep sequencing analysis confirm that the candidates remained attenuated and preserve the documented NOPV2 characteristics concerning genetic stability um, and these vaccines were highly immunogenic in the mice as mono valent and multivalent formulations. And there's also some editorials in the same issue of Nature. Uh, so I pull you in, Vincent, on on uh, area right. that you are. <clears throat> Yesterday, I gave a talk in Penn called "Can We Eradicate Poliovirus Slash Poliomyelitis?" And was it just one word? You just said no and walked away. No, it was uh, 45 minutes followed <laughs> by many questions. But the bottom line is, we can control poliomyelitis by good immunization, but we cannot eradicate poliovirus. Now, the first article you discussed, the surveillance, high quality surveillance. In the US, the CDC does not do wastewater surveillance for poliovirus. Only when there was a case last summer did they do that. So I don't know how they, they say we need high quality surveillance when we don't even do it here. Secondly, yeah. many countries don't even have wastewater. Right? There's nothing to collect. <laughs> that yeah, yeah. A lot of the wastewater is in the stream, right? You're you're drinking yeah. the wastewater. So the only surveillance you have is for AFP paralysis, and it's not good enough because only one in a hundred or two hundred people are paralyzed who are infected. It's not good enough for surveillance, WHO. Okay, that's part one. Second, NOPV two and three, big problem. First of all, as you mentioned, NOPV Two is not perfect. It still paralyzes kids. It still reverts. Remains to be seen how much of an issue that is. They made it because OPV2 is a huge problem. Whenever vaccination drops, they have outbreaks of circulating OPV2. And what do they do to quell them? They go back with more OPV2. So they made NOPV2 to improve that, but it's not clear how better it's going to be. The problem with OPV2 is... It's very transmissible, more so than one in three. And what are they doing for NOPV1 and 3? They're using the backbone of NOPV2 to put the capsid region of OPV1 and OPV3 on it. It doesn't make any sense, Daniel. It's going to be really a big problem. That's all I have to say. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> sorry you didn't have much to say on that, but that's okay. We'll move on to influenza. Um, you know, and I was talking to the urgent care folks. And it's, you know, you almost wish like publications come out at like just the right time when this is on people's radar, but um, it should be on the radar because right now, if we look at what's going on in the Southern Hemisphere, we can get a sense of what might happen to us come this fall and winter. So, as, as agreed in the U.S., flu activity is currently low, as it usually is this time of year. But in the Southern Hemisphere, where it's now winter, cases began um, increasing sharply in early May. Uh, we always look to Australia, and we hear from the Australian Department of Health and Aged Care. Um, this marks an earlier start of the season than some years as case numbers are higher than the five-year average. Some parts of Australia are seeing a spike in illness and the highest number of cases are among children. Um, so as mentioned, uh, those flu patterns could be an indicator of what's to come in the US. But, but it's okay, as we say, we've got these tremendously effective vaccines. We've got this robust antiviral thing called Tamiflu. Is that true? Well. The article, Evaluation of Oseltamivir, that's Tamiflu, used to prevent hospitalization in outpatients with influenza, a systematic review and meta-analysis, right? So here's this whole idea. If we get hit with a flu pandemic, we're just going to give everyone the Tamiflu. It's going to be okay. <laughs> well, the purpose of this analysis was to look at whether the administration of Oseltamivir to adult and adolescent outpatients with confirmed influenza was associated with a reduced risk of hospitalization. They start off by looking at 2,352 studies, uh, ultimately include 15. Um, the intention to treat infected, that's the ITT little i population, was comprised of 6,295 individuals um, with 54.7% getting Tamiflu. Um, across study populations, um, you know, we had 53.6% were female. Um, the mean age was 453 
Um, so people might be saying, oh, it's kind of a younger population. What did they find? Overall, oseltamivir was not associated with reduced risk of hospitalization within uh, this population. Um, we get a relative risk of 0.77, but very wide confidence interval, meaning you know, it might be 0.47, might go up to 1.27. Um, then they go on to look at those older folks. Well, what about the older folks? They go on to report that oseltamivir was not associated with reduced hospitalization in older populations. Here, the relative risk was right there there at 0.99, not seeing much, um, or even in those patients considered at greater risk of hospitalization. Um, within the safety population, oseltamivir was associated with increased um, nausea. Um, that actually was statistically significant. Vomiting also, um, but not uh, serious adverse events. And one of the things I always like, you know, I'm, I'm always a little bit back and forth about these Cochrane analyses, these meta analysis, because, you know, the, you pile a whole bunch of cow pies and it turns into gold magically. I think it's the pressure effect. But if you look mm -hmm. at figure two, you can actually look at each one of the studies and you could see, does it favor oseltamivir? Does it favor control? Um, do those confidence bars just stretch right across? And as you pretty much can see, across the board, some favor doing nothing, some favor oseltamivir, but in every case, it just goes right across the uh, the border there, not reaching any um, statistical significance. Why does that mean that it's such a widespread, Daniel? Uh, that, uh, you know, so what, you know, one of these things, I had a friend when I was doing my PhD and, uh, he said, listen, if you need a statistician to, to show you an effect, if you need to study thousands and tens of thousands of people to show an effect, it's probably not doing much. And I think that's mm. what we're seeing here is boy, even with, you know, some of these different studies, um, you're, you're just, you know, this is not a robust effect that you can pick up with these smaller populations. Is that because the drug just isn't as good as it could be? I think there's two issues here. One, one that we always come across and which you sort of lose in a meta-analysis is timing. Like, mm -hmm. How often are you really getting this drug in within the first 48 hours? And that, that's right. always been a comment that we've made. Um, the other is, I, I, yeah, I don't know. Even if you get it within the first 48 hours, like how robust is this drug? I think we need a better flu drug. Do you prescribe it liberally, Daniel? I don't think liberally. I, I try to look at targeting it to a population that I think might make a benefit. So if we're beyond 72 hours, I'm very honest with patients. I really don't think we're going to see a benefit there. If we're within yeah. the first 48 hours um, and it's a population um, that you know is at risk of progression, at risk of having uh, difficulty, I'm certainly willing to do this. Uh, last thing I want to do is overprescribe it to a young, healthy person who just wants a few hours quicker recovery, maybe. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. let's look Let's not lose this drug um, for whatever limited benefit it might have in the right patients. And we will move into the COVID update. And I am very, well, very excited to share um, the article, Viral Emissions in the Air and Environment After SARS-CoV-2 Human Challenge, a Phase 1 Open Label First in Human Study published in The Lancet Microbe. Um, you know, really nice summary here where they start off with the background. Um, this is that human challenge trial in the UK, by the way. Um, and they mentioned that effectively implement, implementing strategies to curb SARS-CoV-2 transmission requires understanding who is contagious and when they're contagious. Makes sense. Although viral load uh, really should be RNA copy number, but let's be uh, on upper respiratory swabs has commonly been used to infer contagiousness. Measuring viral emissions might be more accurate to indicate the chance of onward transmission and identify likely routes. Now, in this study, they aim to correlate viral emissions, viral load in the upper respiratory tract and symptoms longitudinally in participants who were experimentally infected with SARS-CoV-2. And um, I will mention they did do plaque assays here. So this is not just PCR. So as I mentioned right up front, these results are from the phase one open label first in human SARS-CoV-2 experimental infection study at the quarantine unit at the Royal Free London NHS 
Foundation Trust London UK. We're healthy adults aged 18 to 30, well, previously healthy adults, who were not vaccinated for SARS-CoV-2, not previously known to have been infected with SARS-CoV-2, and seronegative at screening were recruited. And what did they do to these folks? The participants were inoculated with an infectious dose of pre-alpha wild type SARS-CoV-2 by intranasal drops and remained in individual negative pressure rooms for a minimum of 14 days. Nose and throat swabs were collected daily. Emissions were collected daily from the air using this special Coriolis air sampler directly into face masks and the surrounding environment. They're doing these surface and, and hand swabs. They have a kind of a cool uh, graphic of what they're doing. Um, all samples were collected by um, these researchers tested by using PCR, plaque assay, or lateral flow antigen test. So not just doing RNA copy number, they're actually doing plaque assays. Between March 6th and July 8th, 2021, 36 participants, 10 female and 26 male, were recruited um, and 18, so 53% of the 34 participants became infected resulting in protracted high viral loads in the nose and throat following a short incubation period with mild to moderate symptoms. Two participants were excluded from the per-protocol analysis owing to seroconversion between screening and inoculation um, that they identified after the fact postdoc. Viral RNA was detected in 25% of 252 Coriolis air samples from 16 participants, 43% of 252 mass samples from 17 participants, and 27% of 252 hand swabs from 16 participants, and 29% of the 1,260 surface swabs from 18 participants. So not too many participants, but lots and lots of swabbing going on. Um, I was sort of feeling bad for those two participants that they excluded, like kind of sort of looked at the serology before they squirted the stuff up the nose and then said, sorry, go away now. Anyway, viable SARS-CoV-2 was collected from breath captured in 16 masks from 13 surfaces, including four small frequently touched surfaces and nine larger surfaces where airborne virus could deposit. Now, they go on to say viral emissions correlated more strongly with viral load in nasal swabs than throat swabs, which that was interesting. Two individuals, this is great, two individuals emitted 86% of airborne virus, and the majority of airborne virus collected was released on three days. Individuals who reported the highest total symptom scores um, were not those who emitted most virus. I didn't get a correlation there. Very few emissions occurred before the first reported symptoms, only about 7%, and hardly any before the first positive lateral flow antigen test, only 2%. So more detail here with before LFA positivity, 0% in the air, 2% mask, 1% hand swab, 2% surface swab emissions. So a couple, couple sort of bring it together here. So those, uh, those lateral flow antigens, those rapid antigen tests were catching people right when they started to be contagious. We saw the Pareto principle with a few people being the super spreaders, breathing out the majority of virus and most people not contributing much to onward transmission. Um, they observed short windows of high airborne viral emission with only 11% of the infected participants contributing 86% of the airborne virus, um, giving support to this phenomenon of super spreading individuals or events. And I really liked figure two. So, um, you know, folks, I, I recommend going and taking a look at figure two because um, they break down each participant and you can actually look. You can look at the plaque assay results for the nose swabs, the throat swabs. You can look at the air sampling and all the other sampling. And you can really see like the timing, what symptoms, when it starts, when they're putting it out into the air, when they're not. So, I don't know if you had any comments there, Vincent. I just want to say this is out of the UK, which I learned yesterday uh, Early in the pandemic, when they found that cats were being infected, they were considering killing all the cats in England. <sighs> wow. Oh so my there you go, UK. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I did not know that.
<laughs> okay, our, our cat lover. You, you got to now you start some cat lover protest. I, well, they I should do. because there's no reason to kill cats, even if you, they didn't have any idea if the cats were going to be an issue or not. How, how could they do that without any data, Daniel? <laughs> what is that like when they say things like, well, with an abundance of caution, we slaughtered all felines in the UK. I mean, I'm like, whenever someone throws that abundance of caution, we're not going to do the science. We're not going to really know. We're just going to do something yeah, that we think, right. you know. All right. <laughs> so uh, back to COVID active vaccination. So as Vincent, you and I were talking um, and, uh, you know, it, the wind seemed to be blowing in the direction of an updated um, monovalent XBB booster for the fall. Um, and I feel like, you know, we have enough science here that you and I can have a little bit of a discussion about what, you know, where people are falling down on this. Um, you know, Paul Offit, who I think is a voice of reason, I think who looks at the big picture um, when it comes to vaccines, right? Because we're not just talking about making recommendations here. We're talking about the impact of that recommendation, how solid it is in the science, what we think it's going to offer. Um, and so, I do think we need to be really honest here, and I look forward to Paul's comments on this, and some I've seen so far make sense. Um, I do think we have to ask, if a person has already been fully vaccinated, whatever that means at this point, I'll go ahead with, say, three shots. Um, maybe they've had an infection thrown in there, and a lot of people have at this point. Um, let's say they're under the age of 50, um, so low risk of, um, you know, at this point, let's be honest, low risk of ending up in the hospital low risk of dying, um, probably rather low risk even of long COVID at this point. Um, what is the benefit to vaccination? And the other where I think maybe it's clear is, okay, someone is older, they have a number of risk factors, um, you know, even just a temporary reduction in the risk of even getting an infection might have some benefits. So you're going to kind of get my sort of falling on the Paul Offit side of the spectrum here. Vincent, any thoughts? Well, I think it. We we Paul is cautious because he would like to have data. He doesn't do the thing you just said before: an abundance of <laughs> the caution. Abundance of caution, yeah. where we just do something. <laughs> and as far as I can tell, uh, for most people, the other vaccines are doing fine. Now we don't know what if they do a monovalent XBB derivative. We don't know how that's going to do. Oh, sure, is it all about antibodies, Daniel? That's the key. They think. XBB is going to match the current strains with antibodies, and that's all that matters. And we know that's not correct. So I find there's a little bit of disingenuity or disingenuousness in the whole process here. But Yeah. No, I mean, I, I agree. I think that what we've learned is, okay, sure, if you can get those neutralizing antibodies, maybe for three to four months, you're going to reduce your chance of getting um, even infected, maybe going to keep those mucosa levels up. But as we see with flu, like you're going to get it up and then you're going to lose like 15, 20% per month. So by the end of three and four months, you're kind of back. But that is... T cell protection, um, the idea of jumping in quickly with effective antiviral therapy. Um, I, I just think, um, yeah, we, we need to think a little bit about this because I'm about to discuss this next article, which I think is really important. And I will warn people, we're right here at 23 minutes. So if you want to take a breath, take a break, come back, we're about to get into something really exciting. Um, and so this is the publication has COVID-19 threatened routine childhood vaccination insights from U.S. public opinion polls recently published in Health Affairs Forefront. Um, and, and this is sort of the buzz out there, the idea that, oh, what we did with COVID vaccinations has destroyed vaccine confidence. Well, well, what is actually going on here? So they look at 21 nationally representative public opinion polls conducted shortly before or during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so they're looking 2015 through 2023 that met quality standards set by the American Association of Public Opinion Research. So we're looking at solid um, solid polls here, not just anything they pulled up to support a uh, confirmation bias. They reported that only a little more then one third, so 35% to 42% of the US public believes COVID-19 vaccines are very safe for most children, right? So most of our US public is not convinced of that. Um, but then they suggest that these low views of COVID-19 vaccine safety have not spilled over to routine childhood vaccines. So let me go on. So views of routine childhood vaccine safety um, are actually relatively high 
with 69 to 70% of the public believing routine childhood vaccines are very safe for most children. Um, I thought this was interesting. Republicans and Republican leaning independents, 86% saying they believe, for instance, the benefits of MMR vaccines outweigh the risks in 2023, along with most Democrats and Democrat leaning independents, 92%. Um, Perhaps the most compelling evidence to suggest limited spillover from COVID-19 to routine child vaccination is that public attitudes on the safety of routine childhood vaccines have actually risen during the COVID-19 pandemic, which is interesting, from a range of 54% to 61%, um, believing they are very safe pre-pandemic, up to 70% believing this by late 2022. Right? So there's this perception, these are the traditional, these are the safe vaccines. Um, but what about the other shoe? So after approval of COVID-19 vaccines for adolescents, 12 to 15, in 2021, only 40% of U.S. adults indicated high trust in public health agencies mm -hmm. to provide accurate information about the safety of these vaccines. Only a minority share of the public has expressed high trust in the FDA or the CDC to provide reliable information about COVID-19 vaccines throughout the pandemic with only 25% to 28% and 31 to 36% reporting a great deal of trust, respectively. In contrast, high trust in public health agencies to provide accurate information about routine childhood vaccine safety actually increased by 17 percentage points between 2019 and 2022, so from 37 to 54 percent. So let me bring all this back together. In summaries, these polls suggest that Americans have not grown more anti-vaccination during the COVID-19 pandemic, but rather more anti-mandate. Um, and I, I'm actually going to encourage people to go ahead. We'll leave a link. Um, they actually have exhibit one where you can see the questions and responses. Because I think, as we all know, it's really important when you do these polls um, to look at what exactly were they asking. Um, and so I'm going to recommend that people go through and take a look at that exhibit. Um, and then we'll leave in links to the health affairs um, results and also to a Sid Rap um, editorial on this. I think uh, it's good that vaccines are not going to be a political issue, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> I think that. Well, let's circle back to we'll call the Offit and the um, other perspective. We have to regain that trust. People don't trust the CDC. They don't trust the FDA when it comes to COVID-19 vaccinations. We can't just keep pushing without the science. Yeah. We can't just err on the side of, you know, whatever they want to say and, you know, being overly cautious or whatever it is. Um, people want to hear the science. They don't want to put something in their body unless we can really confidently tell them this is the benefit. This is the expectation. Um, and actually, there there's this disconnect, as we're seeing, when you, you force people to do something, particularly when it's new and we don't have the, the amount of education that is required. Moving on to COVID, you tested positive, your patient tested positive. What do you do? Well, Paxlovid is now licensed. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we will discuss a little bit. I'm sure this will keep coming up. But now that it's licensed, it has an FDA-approved indication. All of the marketing by the companies will have to stick strictly to that licensing. Um, but physicians now, um, prescribers now have the ability to prescribe off-label, as we do with many other medications. Use our judgment if we feel like it's appropriate. But I want to discuss the article, which actually is off-label prescribing. The article, Successful Treatment of Persistent Symptomatic Coronavirus Disease 19, COVID-19 Infection with Extended Duration Nermatrelvir Ritonavir, published in Open Form Infectious Disease. So this article describes two patients with hematological malignancies, ALL, ongoing symptoms, positive SARS-CoV-2 PCR tests for months that were treated with extended duration Paxlovid with reported improvement symptoms and PCR becoming negative. So sort of interesting there. I, I wonder how much uh, you know we will learn from that. Two, remember, we've got remdesivir, but only in certain parts of the country is there easy access to that that three day early IV therapy within this first uh, first week. Malnupiravir, 
convalescent plasma in that certain um, subset of immunosuppressed COVID patients, again, in the first few days. And then let's avoid doing harmful things. Um, lots of conversations this last week about just how much macrolide resistance was generated with the Z-Packs, um, how many folks we're seeing with uh, these invasive strep infections. Now, most of our group A strep is resistant to those Z-Packs. So kids, adults um, showing up, they've got a sore throat, they get a Z-Pack. We actually recently had a hematologist in the area who died from strep throat, if you can imagine that. After getting a Z-Pack, it progressed because basically they weren't being treated. So uh, we got to stop doing that. All right. COVID early inflammatory lower respiratory hypoxic phase, a cytokine storm. Um, this is always that time when we're trying to figure out uh, you know, who's at highest risk, who's going to progress. And we have the article, Anemia as a Risk Factor for Disease Progression in Patients Admitted for COVID-19, data from a large multi-center cohort study published in Scientific Reports. Um, these are results derived from a retrospective collection of patients hospitalized for COVID-19 in Italy. Among the 1,562 patients included in the analysis, prevalence anemia was 45%. Um, patients with anemia were older, had more comorbidities, um, and presented with higher baseline levels of procalcitonin, CRP, ferritin, and IL-6. Um, overall, the crude incidence of mortality was about 4% times higher in patients with anemia compared to those without. And after adjusting for 17 potential confounders, right, because we mentioned some potential confounders, the presence of anemia significantly increased the risk of death with a hazard ratio of 2.7 and the risk of severe COVID-19 um, odds ratio of 2.3. And we'll leave a link to that. Um, Remember, steroids in the right patient, the right time, the right dose, the right duration. Um, we continue to get anticoagulation guidelines from organizations uh, such as ASH. We're still meeting and working on those. Pulmonary support, remdesivir, if early enough, immune modulation, avoiding those unnecessary antibiotics and unproven therapies. And I will spend a little bit here, actually more than a little bit, on the late phase PASC or long COVID. And I, I'd always hoped that this would become a uh, significant part of our weekly um, presentation as we would learn more. Um, and the first article really puts this in context. Um, this article captures how devastating long COVID can be for so many. Um, and this is the article, Impact of Fatigue as the primary determinant of functional limitations among patients with post-COVID-19 syndrome, a cross-sectional observational study published in BMJ Open. Um, this study reported on 3,754 adults diagnosed with post-COVID-19 syndrome, PCS, in primary or secondary care deemed suitable for rehabilitation. 94% um, of uh, the patients were of working age, so they're in this 18 to 65. Um, the mean age was actually... Um, 48, 71% um, were female, 89% were white. The majority, 51% reported losing um, one or more days from work in the previous four weeks. 20% reported being completely unable to work. Uh, the headline in SIDRAP was, fatigue can lower long COVID patients' quality of life more than some cancers. And that's what we're seeing here. Um, many long COVID patients were seriously ill. Their average fatigue scores were similar to or worse than those of people with cancer-related anemia um, or severe kidney disease. Their health-related quality of life scores were also lower than those of people with advanced metastatic cancers, such as stage four lung cancer. So just to put this in context, this is not just people who are feeling a little bit tired and lazy. This can be a devastating uh, disease. And I think many people are still trying to understand why one person recovers from COVID while the next suffers from months and ends up with long COVID. Um, and the article, Post-COVID Condition in Patients with Inflammatory Rheumatic Diseases, a prospective cohort study in the Netherlands was published in the Lancet Rheumatology. Now, this is one of those sub-studies that use data from an ongoing prospective cohort study in the Netherlands, all adult patients with inflammatory rheumatic diseases from the Amsterdam Rheumatology and Immunology Center in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, were invited to participate in the study between April 26, 2020 and March 1, 2021. On March 10th, 2022, all the study participants received a questionnaire on the occurrence, 
onset, severity, and duration of persistent symptoms during the first two years of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, independent of their history of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Uh, they also prospectively monitored a subset of participants who had a PCR or antigen-confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection in the two-month period surrounding the questionnaire in order to assess the COVID-19 sequelae. Now, post-COVID condition was defined as persistent symptoms that lasted at least eight weeks, started after the onset, and within three months of a PCR antigen-confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection and could not be explained by an alternative diagnosis. So a total of 1,974 patients with inflammatory rheumatic disease participated, 24% um, of the patients with inflammatory rheumatic disease, and 30% of the healthy controls had a recent SARS-CoV-2 Omicron infection. Um, more patients than controls fulfilled post-COVID condition criteria, so 21% versus 13. Um, so this all sounds good, but then they noted that among those without a history of COVID-19, patients with inflammatory diseases were more likely to report persistent symptoms consistent with post-COVID condition then we're healthy controls, <laughs> the NODS ratio of 2.5. So if you never got COVID, you are about 2.5 times as likely to get long COVID. So this is really a bit of a warning for those just looking for confirmation bias and not understanding. Now, one of the challenges here is that COVID-19 reported symptoms that are commonly used to define a post-COVID condition might be part of the clinical manifestations of, let us say, a rheumatic disease. And the authors point out that this highlights the limitations of applying the current criteria for post-COVID conditions in patients with inflammatory rheumatic disease and suggests that it might be appropriate for physicians to keep a nuanced attitude when communicating the long-term consequences of COVID-19. Could it also be that other diseases that people have had cause similar long conditions? I do. I do. I think that's true. Yeah. And I think this was a wake up, right? Like I, I saw the headlines and then I started reading the study and then I started going, hmm. Mm. So you got to read the study. Don't just read the headline. Don't just read the title. Don't just read the abstract. Spend the time it takes to really look through the article. Um, and that's what we'll keep doing for you if you don't have the time. All right. Now what to do when one has acute COVID to perhaps prevent long COVID. Um, I got one published article, one that is a preprint, and I think that's going to wrap us up. So hang in there. The results of the COVID out trial that we discussed in preprint form is now out as a published article in the Lancet Infectious Diseases. Outpatient treatment of COVID-19 and incidence of post-COVID-19 condition over 10 months, COVID out, a multi-center randomized quadruple blind parallel group phase three trial. Whew, this study is getting enough attention that I already have patients asking about getting a script to have ready to go should they get COVID to use to reduce their chance of getting long COVID. Um, so as we previously discussed, this trial looked at a number of different treatments, and despite not seeing any benefit to ivermectin or fluvoxamine, they reported outpatient treatment with metformin was associated with reduced long COVID incidence um, by about 41%, with an absolute reduction of 4.1% compared with placebo. So giving us a number needed to treat to prevent one case of long COVID of only 25. Now. If one wants to use the metformin as it was used in the trial, I need to point out that the dosing they used was um, titrated. So the metformin dose was titrated over six days. You had 500 milligrams on day one, 500 milligrams twice daily on days two through five, then 500 milligrams in the morning, and 1,000 milligrams in the evening up to day 14. Now, this is important, right? People are like, oh, I'm just going to give it out. Well, the reason this is important, because the first trial that they did before this one, the TOGETHER trial, assessed a metformin dose of 1,500 milligrams per day, right? No dose titration. We're just going to just go right for it. Um, and this would be expected to cause side effects in a large proportion of people, which it did. Uh, this was stopped early, um, really with a substantial proportion of patients not tolerating the metformin without the dose titration. So if you're going to be thinking about doing it based on this study, there is a specific and a little bit of a burdensome, burdensome titration involved. Um, now, it is interesting if one looks at the subgroup analysis, as it looks like the only groups with a statistically significant benefit were those less than 45, 
the unvaccinated and those with a BMI of greater than or equal to 30. Um, so if you've got a vaccinated person, if their BMI is not greater than 30, if they're, you know, over the age of 45. So just want to point that out. And why, you know, I've been musing about this for a while, you know, lots of discussion about why and how might this work? Why would a diabetes medicine prevent long COVID in young, obese, unvaccinated people? Uh, could it have some helpful impact on the immune system or be an effective antioxidant? Well, the authors of the above paper suggest in their discussion that experimentally metformin has shown in vitro activity at a physiologically relevant dose against SARS-CoV-2 in cell culture and in human lung tissue ex vivo. So sort of suggesting that maybe this is a poor man's cheap alternative to Paxlovid. Well, here is where we get the preprint. Metformin reduces SARS-CoV-2 in a phase three randomized placebo-controlled clinical trial posted on MedArchive. And so this is the analysis of specimens collected in the COVID out trial that we just discussed. Um, I will be replacing viral load with RNA copy number in the results here, but they report that the overall mean SARS-CoV-2 Viral load reduction, RNA copy number reduction with metformin was about half a log, so 0.56 um, log 10 copies per milliliter, greater than placebo across um, all follow-up with a p-value of 0.027. Um, they report the antiviral effect of metformin compared to placebo um, was about this half a log on day five um, and about 0.0. 67 log 10 on day 10. Um, and you can actually, um, they have a nice figure where you can sort of see the impact here. That's, is there a nasopharyngeal swab doing PCR? Is that right? That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very small effect. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. And it is interesting. I mean, if their argument is this is, you know, this is mediated by a reduction in viral load, you know, it's working as an antiviral. Um, you know, maybe I'm a person who gets a little bit sensitive about inequity, the idea that we'll give poor people this and then we'll give rich people the Paxlovid. So, well, if you want to uh, show an antiviral, you better measure some infectious virus. Yes, I would recommend that. And also not impressed with half a log. No, different. half a log is uh, not, is error. No. Yeah. All right, so let me just, I, 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 I will throw a couple at you just before we leave. Um, those of you still with us at 42 minutes, the article persistent serum protein signatures define an inflammatory subcategory of long COVID published in Nature Communications. Um, I thought this was interesting as these investigators evaluated the serum proteome in samples longitudinally collected from 55 PASC individuals with symptoms that were lasting um, greater than or equal to 60 days, a little shorter than that, three months after onset of acute infection in comparison to samples from symptomatically recovered SARS-CoV-2 infected and uninfected individuals. Um, now, the analysis suggested uh, some heterogeneity within PASC and identified subgroups with distinct signatures of persistent inflammation, um, type 2 interferon signaling, canonical NF-kappa B signaling, uh, particularly associated with TNF, appeared to be the most differentially enriched signaling pathways distinguishing a group of patients also by a persistent neutrophil activation signature. Um, they suggest that these findings might help to clarify biological diversity within PASC, identifying participants with molecular evidence of persistent inflammation, and highlight dominant pathways that might have diagnostic or therapeutic relevance, including a protein panel that they propose um, as having a diagnostic utility for differentiating the inflammatory from the non-inflammatory PASC. And they propose a serum diagnostic panel of three marker proteins. We can't order these easily, but CCL7, CD40LG, S100, A12, and have proposed that with further validation, these proteins might help to differentiate inflammatory PASC from non-inflammatory PASC. Um, and now the last, this is the last treatment of long COVID. We've been talking about the importance of identifying those with post-exertional malaise. And this week we have the article, The Relevance of Pacing 
Strategies in Managing Symptoms of Post-COVID-19 Syndrome, published in the Journal of Translational Medicine. And here, the investigators retrospectively included patients meeting the WHO definition of post-COVID-19 syndrome, PCS, who attended the Internal Medicine Department of Angers University Hospital France between June 2020 and June 2022. Uh, Followed up until December 2022, pacing strategies were systematically proposed for all patients. A total of 86 patients were included and follow up for a median time of 10, so 6 to 13 months. Recovery rate was 33.7%. Improvement rate was 23.2%. And they reported that patients who better adhered to pacing experienced significantly higher recovery and improvement rates. And I will close it up with what I've been saying for three plus years. No one is safe until everyone is safe. Um, I do want everyone to pause the recording here. Go to parasiteswithoutborders.com. Click on that donate button. Um, It's your support that helps us do um, what we do. Um, I think going forward, I want to continue to provide um, education, information about COVID-19 and long COVID. You will not be forgotten, um, but we need your support. And we are now doing our Foundation International Medical Relief of Children fundraiser. So we are right in the middle, May, June, and July. Donations made to PWB will be matched and doubled up to a potential maximum donation of $20,000 for Femrec. It's time for your questions for Daniel. You can send them to daniel at microbe.tv. Jen writes in your weekly update that dropped on 610. You mentioned how useful it would be to have a tool for understanding how bad one's health, the smoke in the air was, aside from the color coding system. And so in a recent Substack post, Dr. Hetelina shared the image from Berkeley Earth, which shows, Daniel, at an air quality index of purple or nine, it's like half a pack a day of cigarettes. And in New York, it was four times worse than that. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. (laughs) So like two packs of cigarettes if you were out there all day. You know, some people can't be indoors, right? We have a homeless uh, problem in New York. Um, you know, I last night I was I was hanging out with Paul Cayley last night, um, mm-hmm. the the chief vet, and I was talking to him about the animals. How did they do? Right, because that's what, what do you do, right, with all these animals that we have in, in yeah. the zoos? Um, you know, it's a bit of bit of a challenge for um, you know people, animals who who can't get out of that. Um, you know, there were there are a few minimizer comments I have to say on Twitter. I hate to say that, um, <laughs> you know, because otherwise Twitter's nothing but joy. Um, but you know, out west we would get fire. You know, we'd get fires. We would have issues with smoke. But I, I have never experienced. You know, I lived twenty years of my life in Colorado. Never experienced the the level of of smoke that we had. Um, for that Wednesday. Amy writes, I'm an epidemiologist in state public health department. Thank you for highlighting the magnitude of the longstanding 40 year HIV pandemic in May 27. As you mentioned, at least three people in the US acquire HIV every hour. We've made progress in transmission reduction, but not everyone and everywhere. I'm hoping you could expand a bit more on the comment Vincent made about lack of HIV prevention. Although we don't have a vaccine, we do have other tools, namely PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, there are da- uh, daily oral medications, and when taken as direction, PrEP can reduce the risk of acquiring HIV through sex by over 99% and can reduce the risk uh, by injecting drugs up to nine, 74%. Now, these drugs can have side effects, and that's where provider-patient relationships are so important. The goal is to become undetectable if you're living with HIV or prevent it altogether. So a little bit yeah. of info there. Yeah. No, th- this is actually great. I just echo everything that was mentioned here. I think that this is, yeah, it's important to realize that 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 is ongoing. We're seeing tens of thousands of new cases. I like I like the number there. Every hour, three new people here in the U.S. are infected. Um, there are ways um, to combat this. Education, letting people know that the risk is out there, uh, letting people know that there's several options, um, you know, the pre-exposure prophylaxis. We do quite a bit of that in in my practice um, where people are taking a medication, really dramatic reduction in their risk of getting HIV. We meet with them on a regular basis, discuss behaviors. Um, but yeah, there are things you can do, but the first thing is to know that you might need to do something. So but of thanks course, for bringing this up. 
Daniel prep is not available everywhere, right? It's that that is a problem. Right. Also, there's not um, there's not always a lot of providers that are there to provide this. There's also not a lot of providers that are having the conversation, so patients yeah. are aware that they might benefit. Joel writes, after hearing your episode last week, I advised my elderly patients, um, parents with comorbidities to request Paxlovid from their healthcare provider ahead of a three-week trip to Mexico. We think neither have had COVID yet. They were told no by their primary care provider because it can only be prescribed when someone has COVID symptoms or tests positive. I researched it myself and found an FDA fact about the f- full authorization Uh, which says you follow the EUA guidance for prescribing and specifically calls out the question about travel can only be prescribed when symptoms are there or a positive test. My question is, will this ever change as a prescriber? Is it off-label to prescribe it for travel? Please advise. Yeah. You you, you probably remember this conversation, Vincent. Um, Do you you remember Jamie Cedric Rutland? He's one of these TikTok um, digital opinion leaders. I like that more than SMI or social media influencers. And we talked about the fact that even under the EUA, certain economic, you know, you're a wealthy white person, you were getting Paxlovid where, you know, Cedric, uh, he, you know, Jamie is is person of color, and he's like, listen, in my in, in my group, people aren't getting it. People are sticking to the EUA, and so what we have here is now um, Paxlovid is licensed. Providers can actually use their discretion. We we do a lot of prescribing off label. We we are allowed to use our judgment. The pharmaceutical companies are not allowed to market or push or endorse beyond um, the FDA. Um, indications. They're required to do the studies to show, um, you know, what is and and isn't safe and and it needs to be studied. Um, We um, often do a lot of things. I remember atrial fibrillation when I first started to train. Um, We had no FDA approved medications to actually rate control that rapid atrial fibrillation. Um, So we didn't sit there with our hands in our pockets. We actually used medications that we knew would work. And we've talked a lot about Paxlovid and how critical it is for a person um, to get started on that medication in the right window if they test positive. This is not a medication that people are abusing. Uh, This is a medication with care. You can look at the medication list. You can look at kidney function. um, And I certainly don't want this to continue to be an inequity um, issue, which it has been for the last year. Do you need a a positive test or a symptom to get it, to get the prescription? You To prescribe it off-label, you do not. And that is, since it's licensed, that is now something that can be done. Yeah, we have a few emails from other people who the, the pharmacists won't fill the prescription for them because it's not, they don't have COVID. And so yeah, that, I, I think the pharmacists need to sort of step back and realize that, boy, a lot of those medications that we're prescribing, <laughs> um, we are, we do have the, the ability under our license. That's the responsibility we have to make yeah. these decisions. All right, good. And finally, Joyce writes, as a longtime listener, I had a plan for taking Paxlovid While on Eliquis for AFib, should I come down with COVID? That plan is no longer viable after having been prescribed flecainide and metoprolol for 90 days post-cardiac ablation. My doctor does not want me to worry about that unless until I were to come down with COVID. But I worry about not being able to reach him quickly or if he wouldn't want me to take an antiviral at that time. I would very much like to know your thoughts on what my plan for dealing with this situation should be. Yeah, so so particularly the fleck and I, I, I had a patient, um, actually it was it Tuesday night, and I, I probably spent half an hour looking through every single medication to figure out like what would be the interaction, what would I do in this case as an older or high risk individual. Um, and, um, so this becomes a challenge. So you have to look at fleck and I, you have to look at metoprolol. Um, you know, I, I, understand the doctor not wanting to put in that effort right now before the problem is before them. Um, so you really got to make sure that you're going to have access to them because we do, we do have a window. We have this three to five days. Um, and so, to, you know, it would be ideal in my mind to have that discussion ahead of time, have the plan in place. So as I keep saying, have a plan. That's TWIV Weekly Clinical Update with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone, be safe.